Natural Wind Consultant is active in Europe, the United States and Asia. And we've just been speaking about your involvement in India in particular. Can you tell me a bit about that market and the outlook to 2030? Yeah, so um, India is going to be a really interesting market. Um, in terms of activity, we're, there's quite a few years away from, from that. However, it's the drivers um, and the scale of the market that really makes it really interesting. Um, first, the actual drivers. Um, energy, um, India has um, a huge growing demand for electricity in terms of it's a developing market. It's very coastal. Um, they've got a significant amount of what they saw was going to be the new generation was going to be coal, but it's stressed. Um, there's issues with um, land availability, uh, volatility of price, and um, the prices are kept artificially low for political reasons, which means they're losing out to cheaper renewables anyway. So there's about 40 gigawatts of coal, 15 that has never been commissioned but built, but there's no market for the electricity, and the other third, and the other 25 is stressed. So the, the gap needs to be made somewhere. Now they're pushing for onshore and, and solar, which is obvious. Um, but even that's beginning to slow down because of um, tariff issues, again, land availability. Um, um, and the people who buy the electricity in India are called discoms, which are local sort of energy companies. They are financially stressed, which means PPAs are being re renegotiated. So, th so there's, there's a demand, but the current thermal has got a problem, and even the, the onshore renewables. So offshore has been seen as strategic for India. They've got a relatively healthy offshore oil and gas industry, so they understand the, an offshore sector. Um, so they've been putting some, some initial frameworks, you know, some initial milestones in terms of regulatory and policy. So the first one was about 2015, they, they had a, 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 a policy document which started the road sort of down. Uh, down. And then last year, they had um, a, a pot, two um, large acts and policies. One of them was the targets. So they've set a target for five gigawatts by 2022 and a huge 30 by um, 2030. To explain the scale of that issue, that, that challenge, is that that 30 by 2030 is the same target that the UK has and the same target that China has. But the difference is that both of China and the UK have had about 10 to 15 years of developing of regulatory frameworks, of supply chains, and India's gonna match that by 2030. So they've got huge ambitions, it probably won't happen, but you need to set a target and an ambition before you get it. So the regulatory side, they've, they're building various government bodies because there's no consenting regime, for instance, for offshore projects. So they need to create one for that. There is a lack of understanding at the moment or, or, a, or a different appetite for, or um, um, a different, a different idea of where the price might lie because obviously they've looked at Europe developing offshore wind and they've seen the prices so they say well okay it's buildable in scale it's going to be near our industrial areas on the coast and it's relatively and it's coming down in price the challenge for India is the wind regime is lower so the actual energy that a, um, a, a turbine will produce is actually lower so but you also need a different turbine. So you can't just use, for instance, an MHI 9.5 or, or a steam engine. You're going to need to have a new platform, one with larger um, uh, rotor diameter and a lower speed, like you have onshore. So, you, so someone is going to have to develop some wind turbines for that market. The other one is that um, the costs for the first number of projects are going to be high. What's happened in Taiwan is that the initial feeding tariffs were generous, which is great, the right idea, but the projects are also expensive. Um, because again, you don't have a local supply chain. The infrastructure might not be sort of there, so there's going to have to be investment in infrastructure. So there's like a transversal investment to get the ports ready, and the first developers are usually asked to, you know, to pitch in. So the costs are going to be high. So there's there's a, an industrial base in India. There's a need in India in India, but there's, there's not a roadmap yet. Um, you need to build a pipeline, so if, if, if a, a turbine manufacturer is going to invest 50 to 100 million pounds in a new turbine platform, saying that we've got a one gigawatt lease is not going to be enough. So you're going to have to have, like the UK with CFD1, CFD2, CFD3, you're going to have to have that regulatory sort of understanding and policy. So there's technical challenges, there's commercial challenges, so just to wheel back to the discoms. What, you know, I'm not going to build a one gigawatt project if the person I'm going to sell the electricity, so the off-taker risk, if all of a sudden I'm not going to get paid for the energy. So in the, the recent, uh, so in, the, in one of the recent um, policy um, releases, they're trying to get around that by saying that a yet-to-be-decided government body will be the off-taker. So they will provide a 25-year PPA. So, so 
there's an understanding that there's going to have to be a regulatory framework put in place. It's not there yet. There's a lack of understanding of what that's going to be, and I think there's a bit of a, a, a maybe a, a mismatch yet still with the Indian government. Um, we've lost about six or eight months because of the general election, but now, but um, but the political risk is sort of reduced now because Marinda Modi was the was the was in charge when these policy arrangements were made. So we don't think he's going to change change that, but that will hopefully get get back on track now. So it's a really interesting market. There's the, there's the underlying requirement to build offshore wind but there's uh, there's not the regulatory framework there to provide clarity for investors yet and of course um, having having uh, um, confidence in the offshore in, in the Indian market is the thing that would make the credit cheaper and that's been a big driver in Europe is that is that confidence so that's going to have to be in place as well to try and reduce um, the, the, the cost of capital for these projects so um, it's, it's, it will be a project that will be. They will be getting built in, 20, in the 2020s. They, they will not. Re, they will not reach five megawatts by 2020 and 30 by 2030. But it is going to be a next big possible market. It's really interesting. Thank you. Sticking with the theme of um, regulatory environment and policy, and clearly you have a very global perspective. Have you seen any any specific policy instruments that you feel really do support offshore wind in a very tangible way? So, obviously, it changes from. You know, so, there's a, so permitting and regulatory is different in country to country, but at a high level there is. There's basically the right ways to do it. So taking the regulatory and permitting, you, you need to have a clearly understood way of gaining a consent on all the licenses from all the bodies that specific or stakeholders that is relevant and specific in that national in, in that country. So you need to have a, um, a, a pipe that you know that in 18 months you're going to come out of it with the consent. In Europe, it's understood. The UK, especially in the US, they're used to consenting, but they've never consented large sort of wind projects. So BOEM, etc., have been rating guidelines. Um, you need to understand where the federal agencies are, where the where the state agencies are, and local stakeholders. So it's clarity because it's going to be different. India will be different from the US. The US is going to be different from the UK. So, but each country or market is going to has to have a well understood regime, whether that's going to be 12 months, 18 months, but it's understood, and the stakeholders engaged so they don't throw a, 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 a curveball you know, with two months to go, so they're involved in the process and not trying to maybe sort of put a blocker in and, and all of a sudden leverage their position for a, a large gain like a fisherman's type stakeholder. So it's got to be understood, and ideally, if you're a stakeholder, you bring them in early, the government and the developers. So that's one. The other one is the pricing mechanisms understood it's all different the pricing mechanism needs to be specific and sensitive to the maturity of the market so obviously we've seen zero subsidy bids in, in Holland and Germany um, in the UK we are still have the subs you know the the, the um, CFD pots with, um, with with low strike prices um, will the UK government ever allow um, merchant projects which would allow developers unrestrained development because the CFD port is a break. It's actually a way of controlling what's happening around your coastlines. Okay, so a mechanism allows a government to control what's getting built, even if you don't really want to give it a subsidy. It's a mechanism in, in place that gets it. So some kind of mechanism that provides, um, that covers you from merchant risk, ideally, at the moment, because no project's getting built on merchant risk, with, with a merchant risk at the moment, certainly in the UK, and sensitive to where the market is. So for instance in Taiwan, the first projects are expensive, so the subsidy needs to reflect that. So that's the other one. Um, um, and I would say that they're, they're the main two. As you mentioned, the offshore wind market is relatively mature in Europe. Yeah. Do you, to what extent do you think that that is helping to build investor confidence in nascent markets, emerging markets? I mean, it, it definitely does, but it comes with a, a sort of a proviso, uh, to be honest. So. Um, the very the very fact that we, we've got a global offshore wind here, and it's not the uh, renewable UK, or, you know, the old British wind energy offshore wind day, is because it is global. Argentina's looking at it, Myanmar's looking at it, Vietnam's developing with enterprise energy. So there's a level of confidence. The one is that you know governments are looking at, at offshore wind and seeing that it's it's a cost-effective way of of, of constructing um, uh, secure energy sources. Um, and provide maybe economic benefits. 
but that's got to come with the ability to actually develop the projects from a capital and, and, and project finance point, point, point of view. And there is that confidence um, because there's no, you know, there's, there's project, there's, there's investors that have development experience in Europe, and they have Asian teams or US teams, or there's Asian or US private equity or infrastructure funds that have not been in Europe but have seen this happen and understand that it is that it is a viable way and of course offshore wind provides big deals for infrastructure funds where solar does not provide the scale of deal onshore wind does not provide the scale of deal so infrastructure funds don't tend to play a lot in that but in terms of offshore wind the sizes that are there so um, the very fact that people have cut their teeth on development projects in M M in M Europe the fact that there's players that have not experienced it yet but have seen um, peer groups, other investment funds, pension funds, um, experience that in Europe. They see that it works, it gets, you know, they gain finance, the, the, the projects um, are developed. That provides com confidence. The, the, what it does do is that it brings a lot of new, it, it brings the existing players in Europe into Asia, for instance, and it also brings Asia, new players into Asia as well, which means that, uh, that I'm. Might be a lot of some of the processes are very very heavily subscribed. So um, I'm going to put out 49% of my project, and the amount of it, you know, the, the expressions of interest is, is huge, significant, with a number of um, investors maybe that haven't done offshore wind before, um, and that provides a different relationship with the developer. Someone who's done it before might ask lots of questions, and therefore be you know will get involved in my project. Do I actually want a financial partner who doesn't do that? So I might then go to someone, a, a new player, but then a new player might not understand all the risks. It, it's so, and it makes it maybe a bit frothy. Um, so but there's not as many opportunities at the moment. So in Taiwan, there's only been one or two processes for you know for private you know for um, for those um, for new um, institutional investors to buy into projects. But the interest is 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 a huge, especially with the early projects with good feed-in tariffs. So it does make a bit of a frothy sort of market, which, which basically says that there is an interest and it builds confidence. Now it is good because it means that the cost, you know, the more competition there is to finance projects, the, the, you know, the, the, the cost of that come, comes down. If there's no finance, there isn't any projects. So, so it's good, but they need to be advised well and they need to pick the right project and the right part partner and maybe coming in, do you come in in the first project, do you come in in the second round of projects as well? So you need to have a strategic approach. But if you think you might miss out, you know, it, it, you don't always take this, 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 this strategic approach. But you look at what America's going to happen with finance. We've got all the big infrastructure funds in, in the US and there's going to be, you know, gigawatts built on the East Coast and eventually floating on the West. And that's going to open up a huge amount of private equity that have been traditionally always investing in large energy, but maybe a bit fossil fuel type energies that have not been involved in European offshore wind or wind yet. And that's going to open up a new, some new players um, for those markets. So um, there's not going to be a shortage of, of uh, institutional investors. Yeah. That's going to be for certain. Thank you very much. Thank you.